Hi everyone, this is Thomas from Video Mantis. I'm sorry, we're having a couple technical difficulties with this feed, but we want to say thank you for joining us on this Mantis discussion. I'm here once again with Brian Cahill. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Good, and I need to flip around and get a little closer and more intimate here. We've got a couple products below us that we're going to be talking about in a minute. And everyone, do me a favor. If you can hear everything and everything is sounding okay, give me a thumbs up and make sure that everything's good. I'm just doing a quick test here. I hear everything on the feed, so I'm going to continue. Let me know if you need anything. We have an awesome KTEX sound department. What are these things called that go on the back of your phone? Um, Do you know what these things are? The things that allow you to prop your phone. But the reason why I'm bringing it up is because KTEX is the sponsor of this event. I know you, you guys are like, what are, what are we doing? Is this like a QVC commercial or whatever? But yes, we want to thank KTEC for always being here and making incredible boom poles. So in a little bit, we're going to talk about the classic pro poles that just came out. But the reason why they're uh, sponsoring this event is because it's all about boom safety. And so that's why I brought Brian Cahill, because you've kind of like taken it in upon yourself to like really like take education and safety like by storm you know like you're you're like doing research on like how to like elongate your career and things like that so i would love to know more about you can you tell me more about yourself and how you got into sound well i was um as a 20 year old i had gotten a two-year degree in electronic engineering and got a job at a satellite communications facility i was uplinking uh television signals and we were doing a live event one day out of uh, orange county and uh, we were sending bars and tone out all over co the country. And, and I had an engineer um, call me from the Midwest somewhere telling me that, it's, that the tone sounded clipped to him. And I told him he didn't know what he was talking about and <laughs> hung up the phone. Right. And we went live on this event. And it was Sherry Lewis, who used to have the lamb chops, little puppet, oh, right, hand puppet, right. who was the host of this parade. And she came on, and she was way louder than the tone had been. And she was completely distorted. And it took us about 10 minutes in the chain from Orange County down to me in San Diego to figure out where exactly we were having an issue. Right. And so uh, I got in a little trouble because I should have uh, investigated it further when somebody was telling me there was an issue. Yeah, for sure. But at the same time, I was wondering what he was hearing that I wasn't hearing because right. uh, uh, everybody thinks of it as a visual medium, like television is a visual medium. Well, it's a sound medium or an audio medium as well. Mm -hmm. And so I started taking sound classes at uh, City College downtown San Diego. And I got into the film program at San Diego State University. And when people uh, saw that I could load a tape onto a Nagra, a reel-to-reel -reel recorder, uh, all of a sudden I became the sound mixer for everybody's project yeah. at San Diego State. And uh, <clears throat> when I got up into town, um, Los Angeles, I graduated from San Diego State. Uh, I was working at a satellite communications facility that's across the street from Sony Studios, wondering how to get on the other side of the wall, at the other side of the street. And um, I was able to uh, get a deferred pay film, which means that you're not going to get paid for it. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I did uh, six weeks of non-paid work there. Uh, but the mixer that I met on that show, uh, Chuck Bush, kept offering me work. And finally, uh, it was, uh, he got a series. And so I left satellite communications and became a boom operator. And what was that show that you worked on? It was called Amazing Life Sea Monkeys. It uh, starred Howie Mandel. It was a kid show, uh, Saturday mornings. Uh, we didn't know when it was going to air because CBS was airing college basketball at the time. And so nobody knew when the show was actually going on. It all depended on the, the uh, basketball schedule. And so, Are you sure it only depended on basketball? Well, actually, it was, it was kind of a funny show. Um, <laughs> Just teasing you. <laughs> it, was, it was done by the Kyoto Brothers, who did Killer Clowns from Outer Space and oh, wow. Land of the okay. Lost. So you can just tell that they're way out there <laughs> yeah. in their ideas. Well, we lasted for about nine weeks and got canceled, and, and, uh, but I, there was no going back at that point. So I was uh, in television production and doing uh, sound work. Okay, so well, I have to jump up uh, at least maybe, I don't know, a year or two into your career and say I'm kind of a fanboy. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, you worked on the show. Tell me about it. Yeah, well, it, you know, it was funny. Um, and I'm not talking about the movie, everybody. I'm talking about the old school Power Rangers. The guy who was the executive producer on that first uh, deferred pay thing that I did that we never got paid for yep. ended up becoming the line producer on Power Rangers and offered us the job, Chuck Bush and I. And uh, so we took it. 
I think I was making uh, $125 an hour when we started, or, uh, an hour, a week, mm -hmm. a day, 125 a day when we started the show. Uh, the actors, the leads, the five leads on the show are all making $100 a day. Oh, my gosh. And, and having um, to wear the suits and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, they didn't get anything for any, uh, their likenesses were on the boxes and stuff, and they didn't get anything for that. But I won't go into that right. too heavily. Anyways, uh, we were kind of a low-budget crew doing a low-budget show and having a lot of fun. And when the show started to air, um, it became a phenomenon really quickly. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we, we were shooting at Kenneth Hahn Park, which is just uh, 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 up the street in, off of... Uh, um, La Cienega, La Brea. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, when we were shooting before the show started to air, they were bringing in these uh, uh, busloads of kids on field trips, and, and none of them uh, took any notice of this at all. But as soon as the show started to air, all of a sudden, all these busloads of kids were screaming when they came to the park. And so we realized something was going on there. Oh, wow. um, besides being the boom operator on the show, I also got to mix second unit, and uh, occasionally I did stunts as well. So what was it like starting with a show that, you know, had no popularity and then just blowing up like that? W uh, was there any type of uh, change in the professionalism on set? Or, you know, what did you observe in the transition of, you know, like, man, I'm working on a big time show now? Well, no, I mean, the way the show was shot, it was always as if it was a low budget, cheap production. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the crews came out of those low budget uh, Saban uh, movies and stuff. And so uh, we, we essentially shot it that way the whole time. So it's just a very humbling, small crew experience and just a good memory to have. Yeah, yeah, we, we shot incredibly fast. We shot, I can remember, uh, we shot over 100 setups in a 12 hour day one day. Mm -hmm. Oh my um, gosh. We, uh, um, uh, we, Eventually, the show did go uh, union, but uh, it was an incredibly low contract when it did go union. And uh, w we had a good time doing it, though. And it, it allowed me to do things like uh, uh, do stunts on occasion and stuff like that. Nice. Uh -huh. So from there, you went on and started to work on shows like Fast and the Furious and The Ugly Truth and Stuck in the Middle. Right. And now you are working as the production sound administrator at Loyola Marymount University. And that's a very interesting change. So I wanted to talk to you about, you know, why you took this position, if you're completely out and retired from booming, or what's the story? Well, uh, I was looking at doing some teaching uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, I found this job at Loyola Marymount, and it wasn't a teaching position. It was in charge of their production sound equipment. And so I applied, and I got it, the job, and uh, I found it to be very interesting. It's much more consistent than doing production work. Yeah, that's uh, for sure. The hours are better. I've got a uh, 15-year-old uh, and a 12-year-old at home now. And, um, yeah, I, I just found that uh, it was really fun working with the college students and that kind of thing. And uh, this coming semester, I will actually be teaching a class as well. So, uh, so I've been able to uh, get a teaching job out of it also. That's excellent. That's excellent. Uh, as far as uh, day playing or that kind of thing, I am still available to day play if uh, anybody wants to give me a call. Awesome. Excellent. Uh, so actually, let's bounce back into that then. So what is it like working in sound for as long as you have? Since you know, you've been working in since you know, the early 90s, you've seen a lot of transitions going from analog to digital, and you know, seeing even crew sizes potentially change get smaller. What's your opinion on you know, production as a whole over the span of your career? Well, the change to digital is probably the biggest thing that's happened. Yeah. And, uh, uh, we, of course, we're recording digitally uh, now on uh, for the sound uh, with the sound gear, but the yeah. cameras are recording digitally as well, mm -hmm. which has allowed the takes to get much much longer. Yeah. Uh, it also with the amount of production that's going on, so many shows, a lot of them are doing things like uh, their reality shows, or which there weren't a whole lot of uh, yeah. when I started. Are these non-scripted shows like Kirby Enthusiasm or The League, which I did for a number of years, uh, which essentially has an outline. And uh, they have a lot of uh, actors who can improv, comedians, that kind of thing, who uh, then fill it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it means the takes go very long. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I also noticed that you are also a boom operator, but a utility. You know, we kind of do both when we're in this profession. You, know, you kind of have to get what comes. So what do you prefer? Do you prefer booming over utility or utility over boom? 
Well, I prefer booming. I mean, I, I started as a boom operator. I do mixing as well. So, mm. you know, whatever anybody calls me yeah. for, I'll go ahead and do. I can yeah, do any of the positions. And uh, um, I like being on the set. I like being on the front line. And Absolutely. so that's uh, that's the boom's job is is being the uh, the front line of the sound. Yeah, talk mm. a little bit more about that front line because I think one of the biggest the biggest challenges that uh, beginners have when they have to hold that stick on set and nobody else understands what we do and you don't really understand yourself, it's, it's a very challenging thing to have that voice of, of power, you know, because we are that dominant voice of the sound department on set. So it's, it's kind of a catch-22. You don't really have that voice yet, but you need to have that voice. What well, can you speak to that? Well, uh, the more uh, experience you get, the better you'll get at it. And uh, uh, the best boom operators I've ever met are, they're incredibly smart people. I mean, it's not just a physical job, it's a really mental job too. You're playing chess on the set because you're watching a, a blocking and you're thinking as the blocking's going on where the best place for you to be to uh, do that shot might be. But you're also thinking about the second, third, fourth, fifth best places because the camera's gonna be in the one place and the <laughs> lighting's gonna be here and everything else. And so. Uh, you have to think about whether you need to wire somebody for a line that they're doing over in the corner or if you can bring in a second boom for that kind of thing. Uh, as the setup is going on, you're watching it so you can uh, ask for flags to keep your shadow off of uh, places that are in frame and that kind of thing uh, as the setup is going on. And so um, if you have the confidence of the crew, normally you can get what you need. And as long as you're asking for it well ahead of time too. Uh, you're on the set and you're watching the setup and you know what you're doing and you know what you're asking for. Uh, sometimes uh, you may have to have the, especially when you're starting, is have the mi the mixer come in and consult as well. Uh, you want to keep that from happening as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, a lot of shows that I have there, when the mixer shows up on set, they go, like, who is that guy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. What's wrong? Why is he getting out of his chair? Right. <laughs> exactly. Well, are, are, who is he? We've never seen him on set before. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so lack of confidence, yeah, it's it's something that it, it, it challenges a lot of people because, you know, they, they don't want to dip in. You know, there, there's so many challenges with camera, too. How What do you think about how we can improve the dialect between beginner boom operators and camera department, for example? Let's, like, hone in on that department specifically. Well, it, it, communication is always the key, you know, just making sure that you know what the camera's uh, attempting to do and getting frame lines from the camera before the... Uh, shot starts and uh, lots of people have told me over the years that a boom operator is great because they've never gotten into the frame you know and I, I, I want a boom operator that gets into the frame every once in a while because uh, uh, you're not playing the shot tight enough absolutely. if you're not if you're not occasionally getting in the frame you should be riding that frame pretty close absolutely I was always uh, Don Sufol the, the late Don Sufol said that if you're not riding in at least once or twice a day you're not doing your job that means you're not fighting the line our job is not to hide from the line it's supposed to be right up on it just fighting it the whole time right in fact I've watch camera operators as I force their frame down a little bit every once in a while when I have uh, wanted get. to get the microphone <laughs> a little closer. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You got to show them who's boss sometimes, right? The boom boss. Excellent. Um, so since we're talking a lot about, you know, boom safety and, and the health of a boom operator, have you had any injuries while you've been in this career since you've been in it for so long? Yeah, I mean, a number of injuries. Uh, 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 just from wear and tear from uh, how long uh, uh, the day-to-day -day of holding your hands up over your head and, and what that does to you and how much time you're standing even on your feet because uh, as a boom operator, as I said, you have to be there during the setup. So a lot of times you're, you're standing on the set right. uh, during the whole setup, you're standing on the set during the take. And so you spend uh, on a 14 hour day uh, or more, you're, you're spending a lot of time on your feet. Uh, I've had a lot of sciatica issues. I've had problems with my knees. Uh, this year I had uh, rotator cuff uh, surgery finally. I had a wow. complete tear of uh, supraspinatus, a partial tear of the subspinatus, and a partial tear of the biceps tendon. I don't even know what half those things are, buddy. That sounds painful. So, and how long did it take you to recover from these surgeries, especially the rotator cuff? Because you can't put your arms above your head if you have a surgery like that. Right. Well, I'm still recovering from the rotator cuff surgery. It, it took place on March 1st. Okay. I am uh, able to boom, though, at this point. Uh, I still don't have 
full, uh, full movement dexterity. of that uh, of that joint yet, but uh, it's very strong. I've been uh, spend uh, you know I, I go to the gym every day and uh, and so strength is an issue. Uh, uh, but uh, and in fact uh, the the movement of it isn't an issue as far as booming goes. It's just a, uh, in in life yeah. I'd like to have uh, full. Uh, movement. You want to be able to pick up your joint. kids and stuff like yeah, that. For yeah, yeah, sure. I can do all of that. You know, I mean, yeah. yeah, absolutely, man. Well, I, I'm I'm glad that you're doing better, and I think that was this something that you know kind of motivated you to like get involved more with the union in terms of like developing these safety things and you know contacting the companies that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Well, something happened uh, about a year and a half before that actually that uh, caused me to start looking into the issue mm -hmm. uh it, it kind of caught us a lot of us off guard the uh the idea that takes were getting longer and longer and what yeah. the effect was of that to a person's body who's got their hands over their head during all of those takes uh as long as the takes go a lot of times depending on if you're on a location or something sometimes and if you guys want to have a, a quick experiment put your arms above your head for the rest of this podcast we're going to go for about 40 minutes let's just see what it feels like if you want to have an idea we're talking about it right now go ahead Anyways, uh, I was on a show uh, called Alone Together, and it was one of those non-scripted shows like Curb Your Enthusiasm or, or The League. And uh, we were doing a number of takes that were going as long as 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we brought the local in uh, to talk with the producers about the issue. Uh, we had what's called the, the health and safety, safety and health awareness sheet with us. Um, but nothing really changed from that. And in the end, the, the other, we, we essentially, we had two people booming every shot. And the other person who was uh, working a boom uh, got injured to the point where he hasn't worked a day since. He's, oh, he's no. essentially, uh, he's, he's retired. He's a uh, 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 disability. Uh, and uh, at 45 years old, an excellent boom operator uh, was done simply because the takes were going too long. Yeah, you could have another 10, 15 years on his career and it's just done. Right. And wow. so, you know, it, I started thinking about, you know, what we can do and what was going on. And I posted something on Facebook um, on the boom operator page or on the L.A. Sound Mixer page. I'm not sure which. Uh, asking people if they knew anybody who had been yeah. uh, injured uh, while booming and it kind of went viral and uh, based on that uh, at the next union meeting we decided to create an injury prevention committee and they asked me to be the chair of the committee so I'm the chair of the injury prevention committee at local 695. And what was the first thing that you did as this uh, committee chair? Well we pu I put together a committee but it got people <laughs> together and we we had a meeting and we talked about uh, next steps what we wanted to try to do to uh, help and a lot of it is educational um, and some of it was, uh, uh, I started looking into, and a couple other boom operators had started looking into these devices called exoskeletons. So I wanted right. to, uh, I wanted to look further into that. And, uh, but we also, we want to prevent injuries, not just to boom operators. So, uh, they were the impetus to doing the thing too. Uh, utilities who are constantly having to get down on their knees to put wires on people on their ankles or something or, or lay rugs kind of thing. And, and I uh, tore my meniscus. I had to have a surgery at, what was it, 32 years, honey? 32 years old? Something like that. So, yeah, we had an ACL tear because of how many wires we put on ankles. Right, you know? and then jumping up and grabbing the boom to come in and do uh, exactly. second boom work too. Yep. You know, and, and uh, bag mixers as well who... Uh, uh, have all the equipment hanging off of them as well as sometimes having a boom over their head and that kind of thing. So climbing um, up on big things that you should have steps for. And yeah, we're, we're, we, we kill our knees in this, in this profession. And it's something that, you know, like, like even just, you said the cold start getting out of a chair, you know, you're sitting down for 30 minutes and go, it's uh it's not healthy to move that way sometimes. So, you know, doing our best to stay warm on set is, is very important. Um, and some of the devices that you have to show as well. I, I know that uh, about a year ago, we were talking about uh, another company called the Suit X, and that's when we started getting closer in terms of working on education together. And now you have another company that you're working closely with. Is that right? Right. And yeah. wh what's the name of the company? Uh, it's Levitate Technologies. Okay. They're based in San Diego. And originally, the, uh, the owner of the company, the uh, inventor of the device, uh, he was, came out of uh, medical supply 
field. And so he was observing a surgeon uh, getting fatigued during a surgery and thought that he could make something that would help with that. And so they do still, they sell these devices uh, in the medical industry. Uh, they sell them to uh, uh, assembly lines. They sold uh, a couple hundred of them to a, a Toyota factory in Nashville. Wow. And, and excellent. So why don't you bring it out and let's, let's take a peek at it right now. So this is it right here, right? Right. This is uh, called the airframe. The Levitate yeah. airframe. Right. Amazing. So we're going to put this on in a minute. But what can you tell us about this uh, before we actually put it on? Wow, this is built really, really well. Yeah, it's incredibly light and uh, it's small. You know, it, it, uh, a couple of the other ones are a little bit larger and, and more difficult. They've, they've got a wider profile. Mm -hmm. uh, the airframe is, is small and it, you can change the amount of lift that it's providing you by changing these cassettes. Oh, the, oh, these you replace these with a different kind. Right. Okay, very cool. Yeah. Instead of having like a, a a dial intensity knob or something like that. Right. Excellent. Okay. Well, I tell you what, we're gonna go ahead and try this on in a minute. But before we do, we want to say a shout out to K Tech. They're our sponsor for this podcast. And honey, if you notice on the the live stream settings there. We have uh, a boom pole setting, so if you want to click on the straight cabled, uh, people are going to take a look and see the classic pro boom poles. So uh, on this slide, uh, we have the KTEC Classic Pro lineup that um, has, basically they have different kinds of lengths and different configurations that you can put for this boom pole. The greatest thing about this guy is the fact that if you have a problem, like if you've ever had a boom pole that you're closing up, and it like bunches up the cable inside, you know, Brian, what I'm talking about? Yeah, the coil cable. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes they get bunched up. Well, one thing is, you know, KTEC has a really good internally cabled cable. It's, uh, it, they call it the Mighty Boom Cable. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. And the, the, the company that makes this Mighty Boom Cable, it's just a very, very strong coil. And so when they're putting it inside of these boom poles with the configuration, the great thing about them is that you can replace them. So if you ever had that problem, you could just call them up, get the replacement, and unscrew the top of it because it has a removable top section and just replace the, enti the entire insides. The other great thing about this boom pole is that if you are the type of people that are using the new wireless on the very top of your pole, you can remove all the guts and just have a pole that's empty. Or if you want to, honey, go ahead and switch to the other slide. I believe it says CCR. On this guy, you're going to notice that they have all of the internally cabled options that allow you to come out either the bottom. If you get the CC, it comes out of the bottom of the pole. Or if you get the CCR, it comes out of the side. They have a ton of different uh, lengths, so basically you get the one that you need. I know that I am going to be getting a KP20CCR. They're going to be delivering one to me soon, and we're going to do a vault talk specifically for that boom pole. And uh, yeah, so we'll share that with you guys soon. So anyways, we're going to switch back. Thank you so much, KTEC, for sponsoring this event and uh, having Brian come out. And now what we're going to do is we're going to switch back over to us. Sorry, it's going to get a little funny for a second. We're going to switch on our microphones here, and we're going to put down our boom caddies. So give us a second here. Just make sure we've got a good, you can hear it. Okay, and everybody, you can give us thumbs up at home if you have any issues. So what we're gonna do now is switch over, and you can bring that over here, honey, and we're gonna go ahead and put it on. So we're not listening anymore, so pardon if there's any scratches or whatever on the boom pole, and we'll bring this over here so if anyone has any questions, they can ask us. But we're going to go ahead and put this on. All right. So this was set up uh, kind of for me right now. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, come over here a little bit more. Yeah, we'll get yeah. a little closer to the camera. Okay. Okay. That's and good, honey. We're going to put it on like a backpack. Okay. With straps. All right. So, so we put it through like this. Right. And okay. I'm going to get this out of the way, and you will put that one on like that. Okay. Got it. All right. And first, you're going to tighten it up at your hips. Don't tighten the shoulder straps. Yet. Okay. Tighten it up at the hips. Ooh. Now there's. Okay. There we go. There's that. Okay, and you should so have nice these buckle. pads over your hip bones. Yeah, it's very comfortable. It uh, 
Yeah, it's sitting right on the hips, that's cool. And so all of this looks pretty good so far as, as far as the spacing goes up on top and that kind of thing. So I'm assuming uh, why clip don't you that. go ahead, you can do that if you want or you can leave it loose, but go ahead and tighten up the shoulder straps. Okay. Okay, so I'm bringing it down. Yeah, that's bringing it. Now I can feel it touching my upper back a little bit. That's good. All right, so are you a left hand or a right hand lead? Uh, I boom up to my right. Yeah. To your right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me see if I can get this off of here. Right I am a lefty and, though. And change it. This was set up for I can do it me. either way though, if you need to. Uh, I've got the stronger cassette right now uh, over on the left side. Well, we can do it that way. That's not a problem. Yeah. All right, and also uh, there's new pieces of equipment that they've given me, provided me, which you can make a different adjustment on it. And so this is adjusted right now really for a left-hand lead. Mm. So we'll go ahead and do it that way. If yeah, that's, that's okay fine. Oh yeah, I can boom both ways. You should be able to boom both ways anyways, right? right. We've all done it. So what you do is uh, to activate these uh, cassettes is you bring it up all the way and you can hear it click. Mm -hmm. And then you go oh, ahead wow. and put your arm into it. And uh, this is a number six over on this side. Whoa. And, and, um, <laughs> On the other side, I've got the strongest cassette that they make right now. This is a uh, number eight. Okay. And what I like to do on my lead side is use a stronger one. And to balance it, I put uh, a, a slightly less strong one on my, for my back arm. God, this so is so relaxing. We're going to go ahead and click that in. And you're going to feel that this is uh, giving you more lift on that side. <laughs> yeah, it does. I feel like an ogre right now. Arr! That's funny. And so they wow. have uh, cassette levels right now that are available are two through six, I think. Uh, the seven and the eight are prototypes. And as far as I know, I've got the only two uh, in the world right now, the two seven and eights. And right now you're wearing an eight. This is very comfortable. I tried a couple of the other models that you've brought out before and they, they were comfortable, but they, they just felt a lot more bulky right. than this one. And if you turn towards the camera, you can see how it's set up for the lead. This, this arm's giving the maximum uh, uh, lift right now when you're at right around 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. And this one's set up to give you maximum lift when you come up much higher. Yeah, to almost a full, there's uh, a lot more tension right here right, exactly. than right there. Yeah, And that's all adjustable. And I can bring it right down here when I want to rest. Yes. You know, and then whoop, fly back up. I'm flying. That's cool. Okay, so let's bring, let's pick up a boom pole and and see what it looks like. And you said it comes over the left side right now because that's the, the stronger, what did you call it, a cartridge? Uh, cassette. Cassette. Copy that. All right, so we're going to put this out all the way. I know I don't have a microphone on this right now, but we'll throw this out all the way. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that is, I'm laughing because this would normally, you know, even without a microphone, that's that's a long pole. That's going right. to put a lot of torque on my body. That's going to cause my obliques to to bend in. I'm going to lean over on my hip like this. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'll come home and I'll be like, man, my hip is just killing me, you know? And now I don't really feel, oh, even when I go above my head like that, that that's really nice. I think that anyone that booms full time should consider something like this because I could see that, yeah, if I had to do a take on like Parks and Rec, man, they were rolling those cameras for like 45 minutes, 60 minutes at a time. Right. And, you know, like, yes, I understand maybe they weren't booming that whole time, but they were booming for like 15 to 20 minutes at a time you know, three times within that 60 minutes, then resting for two, three, four minutes and then going again. Right. And uh, guys, that kills your arms. That is just, well, you know, you had a surgery. Yeah. So yeah, something like this is, is, is much easier to go and, and do. I feel that it's very easy to move around. I don't feel like my motion is is prohibited too bad. What, what, what can you say about that? What's your opinion? Well, yeah, I mean, it really restricts uh, your motion, not really at all. And because no. it's got the low profile, you can still do things like back through doorways and that kind of thing. Exactly, um, yeah. The, uh, the other ones that I tried, I remember them having a little bit of a bigger back and I was worried about that. I'm like, right. I'm gonna bump into somebody or somebody's gonna bump into me because I'm just bigger. I felt like one of the guys from Avatar or something like that in one of those exosuits. But this is a lot smaller and a lot easier to uh, to maintain. I equate booming these days with the long takes to kind of like being a pitcher for a major league baseball team. Mm -hmm. Like say you were Clayton Kershaw on the Dodgers. 
but there were no other starting pitchers and no other relievers. And so as a boom operator now, it's like being the only starting pitcher on a major league baseball team. And you go out every day and you pitch a complete game. That's yep. kind of what, uh, what it's like to, to boom now on a show. Yeah, I, I don't think people understand what it's like to boom an 80 hour a week show. That is, it takes a, a special type of person to do that. You know, and it doesn't necessarily mean they're a man. I mean, I've seen some women that can really hold a pole above their head for a long time. And it is truly a skill of learning how to manage the resources that you have, your resources being your muscles and your, and your form to protect yourself. It's all about being able to protect yourself so we don't have to have these surgeries that cost too much anyways. Right, well, you know, I think uh, under the circumstances that we're booming under these days, that without some kind of uh, mitigation of the issue, that it's only a matter of time for anybody to, uh, to suffer an injury if they're working all the time. Exactly, yeah, I, I think you're right. With, with the type of work that we do and having to jump in and out of trucks, running around on our knees half the time, booming with our arms above our head, that, that is a definite, definite statement to have that you, you're going to have a problem if you're not maintaining yourself. So what are some of the things, I guess we can walk back over there, we'll flip back to the, um, to the, or actually maybe we should get out of this, if not I'll be in it the rest of the time. Right. So <laughs> what you're gonna do to get out of it is you're gonna grab the cuff with your opposite arm. You're okay. Grab it there. I've got and it. Just lift it off and then let it go up. Okay. And then there's a button down here that'll release the cassette. So I do so the same do thing that. here? Yeah. And then you get used to finding the button and, and once you do, you... Uh, gotcha. Yeah. It just okay. takes a little bit of time getting used to figuring out where all of that is. Awesome. So I don't think that this is necessarily something that you would use to boom all the time with. Well, it's funny. It, it, it depends on the boom operator. Uh, yeah. I've been bringing this out to a lot of sets. Uh -huh. And um, uh, on some sets, the boom operator wants to wear it all the time, uh, thinking that it will help prevent fatigue constantly and mm -hmm. that uh, um, even for easy takes, he wants to use it because... Um, he figures overall it's still just uh, um, reducing fatigue. Right. And then, should I turn this uh, wire off? Yeah, well, I'll just turn it down now, and we'll just go back to our, uh, our booms here, just so people can hear and we can hear as well. And then, uh, for instance, Ram Broussard on American Horror Story felt like he really only wanted to use it when they were outside, and he had the Zeppelin on the pole and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's, it's kind of a matter of taste. Yeah, you just you have to do what's safe for you. If you feel like you're straining, don't. <laughs> it's just there's there's no reason to it. I, I hate to say it is. Um, I don't want to sound rude when I say this, but it kind of comes down to the ignorance of some directors when they don't know what they want and they just keep rolling and rolling and rolling. When instead, sometimes I wish that they would just come down to an educated decision of what they want, get it and cut. Right. which is what we used to do back in the day. Isn't it right? When we were on film, it was so expensive that they're not going to sit here and roll like a producer would be like, what are you doing? And they'd smack them on the back of the head and say, cut themselves because they can't afford all that tape. Right. Well, when you're shooting 35 millimeter film, efficiency was required by the cost of the film and the cost of, uh, um, if efficiency was required. Yeah. by the cost of development, yep. you know, and, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you think about how much a thousand foot mag of 35 millimeter film costs. It was yeah. very expensive. Exactly. And so if there was a director that was rolling 10 minute takes and rolling out all the time on thousand foot mags, the, the line producer w would have come down to the set and thrown them off the set. Exactly. And so the only thing that changed is now media got cheaper. So now we get lazier. In, in a way, it is lazier. In a way, uh, uh, directors feel like cutting is inefficient, I think, you know, and that, uh, uh, Things happen uh, when you cut that uh, you you go backwards instead of forward. So a lot of times with the digital media, it seems like the director wants says don't don't cut don't cut don't cut comes running out to the set to talk to the actors as if there's been a cut. Yeah. Uh, they tell the actors what they want instead of what's happened or you know uh, uh, ask for something different. Yeah. And then run off the set and and yell action again as they're running off the set. Now for a boom operator, if you're on a practical location and you've got a low ceiling and you've got an 18 foot pole. Yeah, that's killer. And the director runs in and says that, you can't come to a resting position with that pole. So you're still, you you're might be in a resting position there. like this, but you're not in a resting position where you can put the butt mm. end of the pole down because you don't know when that director's gonna call action again and you can't be pulling out 
uh, after they've called action because yeah. they're obviously going to miss lines that way. You literally just have to wait and just strain yourself until you go. Right. And they and they might take a really long time. <laughs> and, they, and they don't understand. You almost want to be like, hey, do you want to hold this while you're talking to them just so you can feel what you're doing to me? Yeah. You know? I love it when they, they push the pole out of their way as they come onto the set. Too. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Anybody that walks up and backs the bottom of the pole, like, behind you, too. It's like anyone. Like, when you've got, when like you said, when you've got a low ceiling and you've got an 18 foot pull out and somebody says okay hold on we need to fix something and then like all of a sudden the sea of people just start walking around you and you're like whoa 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 what are you doing right people need to have a little bit more courtesy to like understand like we have a weapon <laughs> that's like could hit somebody in the face if you're we right. if you bump us if somebody pushes the back end of the pole the front end is going to go uh it's going to uh, dip and well. hit the actor yeah. in the face or something like that right. and it's it's uh, it's no bueno you know one thing I w w do want to talk about with the uh, exoskeletons, and, yeah. and we were bringing it up at the last local meeting and stuff like that, is people wanted talking points as to how you, you sell this to production. So mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. a practicality involved um, because uh, what you're trying to do is convince a production that ha hasn't had this as one of their expenses, one of their light items on a show before, that they need it now, You know that they need to have this thing on the, the set. And, and I would assume that people are going to be like, why do I need this? You know, Boom operators have been doing this forever, blah, blah, blah. Right. So right, what's your exactly. what's your rebuttal on that? Well, this came out 10 years ago, and it's called the Safety and Health Awareness Sheet, and it's produced by the AMPTP. It's pr it's published by the AMPTP, and and so there was a recognition as long as 10 years ago, or, and even more because it took a couple of years to agree on the language on this. Right. Uh, We're going to put a link to this in the comments after the show, so everybody can read this official document. And that it was becoming an issue. Long takes were becoming an issue. And so uh, the language is a little weak on this, but uh, uh, it does talk about harmful uh, effects from uh, extended takes. And uh, it does recommend certain actions too, like communication, especially early on in pre-production and that kind of thing with, uh, with the producers uh, deciding how you're gonna handle long takes. And uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, equipment options suggested and personnel options suggested uh, here. And so you could bring in another boom operator. Uh, one of the things that's suggested at this point is that you have your utility takeover booming uh, some takes and stuff instead. But all of us working on shows realize that uh, a lot of our utilities aren't available for that yeah, either. They're usually booming too. Right. <laughs> they're, they're either already booming uh, some lines during the shot, so you can't replace a boom operator with somebody who's already booming. Yeah. Or they're so busy with the other uh, 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 parts of the job that yeah. they aren't available to come in and take over uh, booming. And you really can't have somebody come over and take over booming on take three or take four of a very complicated setup. Yeah, I mean, no. that, that's, that's just all been, when you start getting it. Right, exactly. You know? So, uh, so uh, one of the ideas is that you would bring in a fourth person or, or another boom operator on days where you knew it was going to be uh, particularly long takes. Yeah. Now, the cost of production of that is going to be very high. Yeah. Because uh, you bring somebody on the set, even if you're calling it an eight-hour day, on a day rate, uh, it's going to be very pricey for a production to bring somebody in. Uh, another option, an uh, equipment option, might be to bring in a Fisher boom. And everybody knows what that is, right? It's the one with the crank, so you're sitting on or standing on. But uh, if you're working locations are uh, the way they build sets these days without wild walls and right up to yeah. the fire lanes, uh, a fissure boom is quite often going to be impractical. And so another option would be something like one of these devices, one of these exoskeletons. And uh, you can uh, compare it to what camera's already using because camera's got a, a number of devices like this. So you could say it's comparable to a handheld camera operator using an easy rig. Right. And, uh, and in fact, I think the rental rate for this will be just about the same uh, as an easy rig. So I was looking up just this morning, I was looking up what easy rigs rent for, and it's 125 a day or, or a three day week. And so uh, at, at a cost of, for that unit right there is, is $5,000, uh, what we were just looking at with the pieces on there. Um, and, and that's very comparable to what an easy rig costs. Yeah. So my feeling is that this would also rent for 125 a day or something like a, a three day week of 375, something like that. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, if people start thinking, okay, if, if your eyes and, and your mind just went $5,000, what? Let's talk about how much the surgery costs for a rotator cuff. Like, how much did that cost? 
You know, I'm, I'm assuming you have insurance through the union, but you still had to pay a copay. Right, there's right? a copay. So, I mean, it, there, there's ancillary costs that you don't think about either, and it's not just directly paying for whatever part of the surgery you are. It's, it's about not being able to work exactly. uh, for six months yeah. afterwards. Uh, and then uh, kind of slowly working your way back in and stuff too. I mean, yeah. unless if you got like that one finger job mixing, like you were kind of like this, maybe. No, I don't know. Bad yeah. joke. Bad joke. Yeah, uh, I, I wrote an article <laughs> about recovering uh, from rotator cuff surgery for the last uh, uh, production uh, sound and video magazine that the local 695 produces. So there's a, we could just, uh, do a link to that, too, if we wanted to. Well, you know what? Let's put a link to there. But also, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? If there's anybody that is concerned, because actually I have a couple friends that are talking about getting rotator cuff injuries. What can you recommend to them so they can, you know, cut their uh, recovery time in half? Well, uh, there is uh, something. Well, first of all, if you're going to get this surgery, or at least the, the extent to that I got it, it's, it's going to be very painful. Yeah. It's going to be incredibly painful for the first six weeks of recovery. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, and there's not a whole lot you can do about that. Yeah. Uh, but it, 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 it was like right at six weeks, all of a sudden, it became much, much more manageable, the pain. Uh, there's a lot of physical therapy involved in recovery. And um, uh, there's something that they, they, they make for a surgery now, and I can't remember what the name is off the top of my head, but it's, it's essentially sterilized bovine uh, uh, tendon, which they graft onto uh, the place where they've done the surgery, and then your own tendon will grow over the top of it. Wow. And they say that it, it, uh, it speeds up recovery by six weeks, which is really significant on something like this. You know, if you think about what six weeks are worth, is worth. Yeah. Now, the, uh, our insurance doesn't cover the cost of that right now, but I felt like uh, uh, the benefit still outweighed the cost, and so I went ahead and, and uh, uh, got the... Uh, uh, the graft as well when I had the surgery. Amazing, amazing. So you can go through all of these troubles or you can get one of these exo vests and protect your body and make sure that you know you have a long career and you're safer and you, you don't have these issues. Right, Th there isn't one single solution to the, the issue that we're no. having. Uh, one would be to uh, try to limit the length it takes, but uh, that's, that's a tough uh, argument to make to producers. Uh, also, just make sure that you're stretching and you're, uh, you're staying fit as well because that'll make a big difference in your career. And uh, I, I also write in the article that it, I understand the difficulties of that being a father of two and uh, when you're working a 12, 14 hour day or more and, uh, and doing your parental duties, <laughs> also trying to make sure you're staying uh, uh, fit as well is, is, uh, is not easy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a challenge to do all that. <laughs> yeah. Having a kid is a totally different, our, our kids right here, Natasha's kind of playing around while we're uh, doing this podcast today. So, well, thank you for sharing the, the safety and health awareness sheet. We're going to make sure that this goes out. Um, so another question that I have for you is, you know, dealing with that, you know, you, when you're talking to production and you're introducing these topics, you, you did say, you know, you want to bring it up to them in the beginning. And I, and I really want to like focus on that for a moment, because if you are always reactive and saying, well, come on now, you, you know, the director's doing all these long takes and if, you know, like that, you start sounding like a whiner, then, you know, you're not really going to, you're going to have a harder time convincing them to get these types of tools to help you instead of doing it right when you're negotiating. Right. Yeah, I mean, but it could be something that comes up in the middle of a, a show, too. It's like, hey, you know, these takes are getting longer and longer. Or, or you know, we didn't realize when we started that you were going to be doing 30-minute takes, 25-minute takes, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and since that is the case, uh, there is a piece of equipment that we think we really should have on this show. Uh, and it, you present it as a safety issue. Uh, people can't ignore safety issues, really. Yeah. So you, you don't prevent, uh, present it as a, as a complaint about the long takes. You, prevent, you, you present it as a way to uh, prevent injury is I think what you do. And so I think that that's a really good way. Like if you, yeah, because like, you're not taking it from a confrontational point of like, I don't want to do this take. It's too long. You're saying we shouldn't be doing takes these long because it's damaging. It's not, it's not healthy. It's not safe. Right. I mean, you could say the way that the director sets up a shot that makes it difficult for uh, uh, boom to get the, the sound because of a, a ceiling issue or something like that. You could say the director is really boning me, you know, <laughs> or you could say to the director, uh, 
in order to get the sound that you are going to want to have for this, you're going to have to give me uh, another shot that, that allows me to get the boom over the top of it instead. And so you're working with them instead of arguing with them, and, and it makes a lot of difference as far as uh, how people receive things. So I, I think uh, if you go to production and tell them that uh, there's a safety issue that you'd like to discuss with them instead of saying, you know, you're screwing us with these 25-minute takes, you're killing us. <laughs> Don't uh, say the word screwing us on set. It's probably not a good way to go ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're, you, I think you've got a much more uh, uh, be better chance of being heard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's a much safer way to go. Um, so uh, I, I noticed that you brought out a, a document here. What's this about? Well, I, uh, I was asked at the last local meeting to come up with some talking points uh, yeah. uh, to help, again, we, we, as we were talking about, uh, convince a line producer who hasn't paid for this item before that they need this thing on a production. And again, it, it's, a, it's a, it, it, uh, representing it as an issue of safety, uh, an issue in th how production has changed over the years. So where this wouldn't have been needed before under the circumstances that we're shooting under now, it is a piece of equipment that uh, has become a necessity. Like an easy rig, which they're yeah. probably already paying for, is considered a necessity by the uh, camera department. Exactly. And uh, as I said, I think the rental price would be very uh, similar to that. Uh, of an easy rig. So um, again, now a another practicality issue of this is that these aren't available for rent right now. Mm. Um, you have to purchase one uh, from any of the three companies if you want to have one on set. There there are no rental houses that have any of these right now. And part of what I'm working at is, is uh, uh, getting the rental houses to uh, be interested in them as well. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that will interest them, though, is if, if people are buying them and then renting them to shows. And it, you know, I, I mean, if a show decides that they're going to uh, bring this piece of equipment on, and you're making three hundred seventy-five dollars a week in rental off of it, clearly it's not going to take many weeks for you to pay back the five thousand dollars on the thing, and you're exactly. actually going to be making a profit off of it. Yep. And I think, uh, uh, of course, people who are buying these uh, want to think, of, you know want to believe that that's going to take place too but I, I i actually do i believe that i believe that in five years every set is going to these are going to become very common on sets that mm -hmm. every set's going to have one of these and whether you're renting it from a rental house or you own your own that you're renting to production uh i think there's a profit to be made off of them it's not a, it's not just a matter of, of of safety it's it's a matter of uh putting more money in your pocket absolutely well you know safety is part of our business and when we can do our job more professional and safer better longer than our peers, you know, then absolutely. You know, this is something that, you know, where another company might have trouble or their sound starts to suffer because maybe the boom operator isn't able to ride that line and he has to play it a little safer. That's what sometimes that's what you have to do when you get tired. You have to go up a little higher to make sure you're not dipping into that shot. Right. And being because able you're not to as precise anymore. And also it means that you're not uh you're not cueing the microphone as well anymore either. Exactly. So having something like this where it says, you know what, I'm going to take, you know, 50 or 60 percent of the intensity that wears me out throughout the day, where at like hour 10 or 11, I'm starting to get fuzzy, I'm exhausted. Um, and to be able to be a little bit more sharp and on point, I, I would absolutely want that. That makes me better than my peers. And I know that we're a friendly group and that we're all here to, you know, you know, help each other out. And, you know, we have a very big community but down to the reality of it we are professionals in our own business and we have to work uh, at our own business and get better for ourselves because it is a competition we are trying to get work so you know it's always about being better than your competitors and this is one way that you can do that right well you know and and uh, a, a couple of more technical things about it is that uh, you can change the cassettes you change the amount of lift that it provides uh, so some people won't want it to do all of the work. Some people will just want some support going up. Uh, and of course you can change those depending on whether you've got a, a super long pole with a Zeppelin on the end of it or if you've got a, a shorter pole and you're working interiors and uh, you got a MKH-50 on it instead of a, you know, an 816 or whatever too. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so these are, they're, they're quite adjustable to uh, whatever your needs are. 
at the time. And uh, when you purchase, does it come with all of the cartridges, or no. do you? Okay, yeah. <laughs> there the, you the, go. The, the five thousand dollar price on this one comes with two cassettes. Okay. So I mean, like the, a low the thing and a high do, intensity. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you you might decide that you want two eights when the eights become available, you know, or you might decide you want something more like this setup where you had a six and an eight. Okay. And what you, did I have? I had what you had a six on uh, your back arm and an eight on your uh, lead arm. Okay, and it goes up to what a ten? No, that's it. Eight's it. Oh, eight's the highest. Yeah. Okay, because that man that shot my arm up pretty good right yeah yeah and um uh you can buy extra cassettes if you want to but uh this company the the cassettes cost a thousand dollars each so okay yeah so, so you, you can, can always get you more to. okay right. gotcha yeah, and you can do it over time as well you know you don't have to uh you could make an initial expenditure of five thousand dollars but uh as you've worn it over time and you decide that you want it to do uh, different things for you. You might decide that you want a different cassette and you can go ahead and just get the one cassette from them as well. Um, uh, some people want it to do all the work. They want to essentially raise this arm up and then have it do all the work of holding the arm up. And that's kind of the way I had you set up over there. And like I said, other people, they just want some support, but uh, not uh, not shelving like, uh, like this one's set up to do right now. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it just depends on what you're doing. Like I could see like if I was working on could you use this with an eng bag um well we have pictures uh of paul buscemi actually doing that uh he came down uh paul buscemi uh does a lot of bag work mm -hmm. uh great. in fact he's going to be making our eng mixing course that'll be out in 2020 right so yeah we're very excited about that um we went down uh um, chris walmer uh ken strain and uh Paul Buscemi and I all went down uh, to Levitate's offices in April of this year. Awesome. To, uh, they, they hadn't uh, had any exposure in the industry yet. And so we went down to check out their equipment and see if it uh, seemed like it was viable to us. And so, yeah, Paul has uh, worn it as well. And so can you uh, set this up to work with a bag rig? Yeah, you can set it up to work with a bag rig. Okay. And it's, for, for the most part, Paul said it was pretty comfortable? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now... Uh, you know, everybody's going to want to tweak it a little bit for their own uh, purposes and stuff right. like that, too. So, you know, you'd have to uh, uh, make adjustments. What, I, what I've found with these things, with all three of the manufacturers, is that uh, uh, you put it on somebody and you try to get it close to fit correctly for them. And they'll raise their arms up and they'll see that it's doing something. But uh, a lot of times they go, ah, I'm kind of fighting it here or there, too. Yeah. And you keep making little adjustments, little adjustments, little adjustments. And finally, all of a sudden, you have the aha moment where all of a sudden uh, it's become part of you right. and you're working together. And th then they say, if you can get to there, they say, oh, I see now why the real benefit uh, to this piece of equipment is. Okay, and so that means if you guys are trying this on for the first time, don't just assume like, oh, okay, no, it doesn't work. It feels uncomfortable. No. It might mean you got to not wear it in, but you've got to get it right to your body so it connects and, you know, becomes one. Right. What, I, what I've been doing with this unit here is I've been taking it out to different shows like the, the Goldbergs, American Horror Story, uh, uh, Schooled, some other places. And I fit it to the boom operator who's working and interested in trying it. But I leave it there for a week mm -hmm. and I encourage them. I, I give them access to uh, videos to fit the thing and I encourage them to make tweaks on it because cool. uh, um, you're only going to find out how it works best for you by uh, moving it. You, you might think you've got the ideal setting and then you may uh, uh, move something, just move it a, a little way one way or the other and find out that it, it actually works much better right. uh, with just a really small adjustment one way or the other. Absolutely. Amazing. So we'll make sure that we put the links to this product and we'll make sure that uh, you're embedded into the thread of this. So if anybody has any questions, you can answer on the Levitate system. The Levitate uh, airframe? Airframe, right. The Levitate airframe. So excellent. So I tell you what, let's start wrapping it up. I guess the last thing that I want to start doing is because you know Video Mantis is all about bridging the gap between students and professionals, I wanted to know if you had any messages to give to the students of the future. What can you? You give, you know, uh, a bullet point to these students that can help, you know, tighten up the time that it takes to get them to be a professional. Well, there's some things you're only going to learn on set, mm -hmm. and you just have to 
uh, have the experience in order to do it. But there's other things that you can learn off of set. And, and whatever pieces of equipment you're using, make sure you know those backwards and forward and uh, that you really don't have to think about it or, or try to find out where it is in the menu when you're on the set because that time you could be using trying to figure out other problems on the set. So uh, know the equipment really well. If you're, if you're coming to fill in for somebody else on their set, uh, make sure you know which equipment they're using. Make sure you've got the manuals for those downloaded onto your, uh, your pads or your, your, your laptop or whatever it is you're bringing out with you, hard copies of it even if you want to, mm -hmm. uh, so that you, uh, you don't uh, uh, look bad because you don't know uh, where to get to in a menu or something like that. And, and people are looking at you and waiting for you to figure out why you're not getting sound uh, into your uh, recorder or whatever it is, you know. So just uh, be incredibly well prepared uh, on the technical side of the thing. And so that the things that are naturally going to occur on set, you can devote your time to those. Yeah, I guess, you know what, as an independent contractor, it's it's important to realize that we're not working every single day, even as the professionals in this industry in L.A. You know, some of us are triple booking themselves every day of the week. Uh, other people are not. And in, in between the lulls of when you're working and when you're not is the time where you're really honing your trade, where you're studying and learning and practicing, uh, w learning the menus of your equipment practicing with the microphones, learning their reach and their limitations so you can use that new knowledge when you get on set. Right. Right now at the university, uh, I was able to get uh, Kantar to loan me a Kantar Mini. Oh, awesome. And so uh, uh, only for the purposes of, of being able to understand it, to learn how to use it yeah. and, and uh, to be able to explain it to students and that kind of thing. And so, uh, yeah, uh, Scott Farr, a uh, mixer who works with uh, Aton Kantar, uh -huh. is uh, he's going to be building it for me tomorrow, actually. we've got I, I, I got a bunch of parts sent. Oh, he's coming France. to Loyola? No, I'm going out to his house. Oh, actually. nice. But, okay. Uh, um, uh, they sent me a whole bunch of parts uh, from France, and uh, apparently we were picking up a, a, a rental from True, <laughs> and, and Scott's going to take all of these things and put them all together. You're and like, then, I uh, can't pronounce this, and I don't know what it does yet. <laughs> right, and show me how to use it. And so then I can explain it to students and professors and things over at the university as well so ah, that we're familiar awesome. with that piece of equipment. Very cool. Yeah. You know what I'd love to ask you? When you get kind of like fully versed in this uh, Aton world, would you love to come back and possibly talk about it on a Vault Talk? Um, sure, we could do that. I think you'd probably be better off. Uh, I'll the come expert to you. Is Scott Farr, oh, I think, okay. is who you might want to uh, be speaking to on that. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Well, maybe we'll uh, get both of you on. We can have a have a good play date. That'd be yeah. fun. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for coming on to this Mantis discussion today, talking about boom safety. I think that this will definitely help people give them the clues of, you know, how to, you know, have that dialogue with production and as well as how to, you know, elongate their careers a little bit more. So I appreciate it. I'm glad I could come by. Yeah, no problem. And uh, if you're cool with it, are we able to take the documentation that you wrote and things and, you know, share that or at least the safety and awareness bulletins? The, the safety and awareness is ready to go. The others, uh, I, I, I think I would want to... Uh uh, Polish it a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we'll do our best to, you know, maybe include that in a blog later so people have some written dialogue that they can, you know, memorize and, you know, practice so when they are speaking to production, they can have a little bit more confidence. Right. Ab yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for watching this episode of Video Mantis Mantis Discussion, and we'll see you on the next one. Take care.